guess I could have turned off the banner during the video, but this is what happens when we don't have supervision. <laughs> we make our own rules. Uh, speaking of, it's been a long time since I've been here for Laughing Place Movie Club, so I'm going to have to fight the urge to talk about WandaVision during this. But uh, <laughs> yeah, so uh, I'm Mac. I've got Kyle with me here, and uh, this is another Laughing Place Movie Club. And as you can see, we're talking about uh, the latest 30 for 30, Al Davis versus the NFL. So watch on ESPN Plus if you haven't seen it already. But I mean, we're going to be spoiling things if spoiling real life is a thing. Yeah. Yeah. And speaking of, uh, it's it's interesting that uh, we talk about this. I, I mean, obviously, this is a, a all true story. It's 30 for 30. It's a documentary. But uh, Al Davis and Pete Rozelle are the two big players here. And they unfortunately passed away uh, quite a few years ago at this point. And this is still told by them. This is their story. Uh, there's no narrator like we normally would get in a 30 for 30. Instead, it's it's Al Davis and Pete Rozelle, but done uh, in with deep fake technology. And uh, yeah, it's uh, it's pretty interesting. Uh, well, what were your thoughts on on these more or less CGI'd uh, versions of these two NFL icons? I thought that the like I don't know how they got the the audio. I don't know if that was just made up of whatever they previously said, or if that and if that was all scripted. Because obviously they do use archival footage, and that looks perfectly normal. But when they're doing the deep fakes, it looks like a video game. Like the first half, at least, they try to keep them in the dark. So I guess hoping it would look better. But yeah, it just looks like you're playing a video game. Like the they actually didn't look too bad. It's just the motions just yeah kind of clicky yeah if they're there's a lot of shots where they're kind of like standing off or like there's a lot of like pete rosell's like sitting in a, a stairwell um and the uh it doesn't look bad in that situation but it's you're right it's when they're talking and their mouth like doesn't quite match what they're saying and then you kind of get that uncanny valley sort of situation where it, you know something's just slightly off uh, i also thought, sort of motion yeah there's just like kind of like a stutter yeah too. Yeah, and you're you're right. They they use a lot of like archival, uh, obviously a lot of archival footage and um, you know audio and stuff like that too. But they did also say that they pulled from from interviews and basically every bit of information that they had about these two guys and uh, basically pieced together what they what they think these two would have, would be saying in present day. And it it, does, it kind of seems off in some par parts too, with just uh, you know their speech patterns and stuff feel a little bit off sometimes. So um, yeah, it was it was a little bit weird, but I I think overall, it, they did a pretty good job of um, you know more or less bring, bringing these two uh, back to life and and having them tell the story. Yeah, I think that's an interesting conceit for it. I'm not sure that the deep fake part of it works, but I also don't know if it would have worked if it was just like a a faked narration either. Like I think yeah. it might have been confusing because you're like oh is this really what he said or wasn't it so having the deep fake maybe they purposely made it look you know fake because they want you right. to associate hey no this isn't really what they said but i don't know it didn't quite work for me it kind of reminded me i'm like okay they most of the story is told in archival footage and interviews with people who are alive but it reminds me of like on 20 for 20s. You're like, okay, well, they have this piece of script, this part of the story that they want to get in, but they don't have anyone to say it. So then they just have like their ABC News contributor who just knows everything about every 20 for 2020 that they've ever done. You're like he doesn't know all this stuff. He's just, you know, playing the role of narrator, but there is no narrator. So they're just filling in the gaps. So I don't know yeah. if that's the best way to do it, but it, it, it wasn't that bad. Yeah, no, I, like I said, I, I like that they took a, a different approach to this one uh, because the the story is so personal between these two and they actually uh, bring it up as one of the greatest rivalries in the history of sports, which, you know, the, not at the top of the list when, when I start thinking of uh, uh, great sports rivalries. But uh, after hearing, I, I knew a little bit of the story, but after getting into it, uh, you know, much more deeply with this, um, yeah, it's hard to argue. I mean, as far as personal, like one-on-one -on -one rivalries go, uh, and it was obviously more the business. It was the biz. It was one hundred percent the business side. It was these two never met on the football field, uh, which might have been pretty interesting. Maybe we could get that in deep fake technology. That would be pretty cool. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, they uh, they did have a very interesting, very personal uh, 
uh, rivalry, and it, it was uh, an interesting story to to do it this way. So yeah, what was, then, in, what was interesting yeah. to me about that story though was just that obviously we know some of the the strokes like. I know that they were in Oakland and then I know that they were in Los Angeles. I know they went back to Oakland and I know went to Vegas, but they were still able to be surprises because I didn't realize that they had that like delay in going to Los Angeles. Like, could you imagine if the team just announced they were going to be in a different city and then sold season tickets and then didn't go to that city that next season? Like that's kind of mind blowing in today's. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. That is a, a crazy situation. Imagine being one of the people that bought season tickets in, in Los Angeles. And then you find out the team's not even playing there. Uh, yeah. It is a pretty crazy situation. And it's, it's interesting to think about the fact that the NFL is still a relatively young league and is still, uh, you know, progressing so much. Uh, it, it's, it's hard to remember that sometimes given that it's this, you know, entertainment juggernaut that it is today. Oh, we might have some technical difficulties here, but uh, I do want to um, kind of just give a, a layout for for what the the story of this thirty for thirty is, and that's uh, Al Davis is the longtime owner of the yeah Oakland, the then Oakland Raiders, uh, eventually Los Angeles, eventually Oakland again, eventually well, <laughs> Las Vegas, uh, and he goes through this whole legal battle trying to move the team from Oakland to Los Angeles for financial reasons. Uh, and Pete Rozelle, the longtime commissioner of the NFL, is holding him up for fear of that being a slippery slope and transitioning the NFL into having a, a free agency period with their franchises where cities around the country will just start a bidding war for these teams. And, uh, you know, obviously then changing the face of uh, professional football uh, going forward. So, it's a very interesting, complex story, and it's interesting in a way that uh, it's not uh, a football story on the field. You know, we don't, we're don't, we not worried about the outcome of games, although they do play a role in, in the story a bit. Hey, welcome back. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully. <laughs> so um, before I get no, too far... I, I think I know what you're saying. I didn't hear anything you said, but I'm going to assume that you're talking about how there's not a bunch of football played in this, except that there are some key moments where it comes in. And I yeah. think that's a really good point, especially like the, I think perhaps one of my favorite parts of this was when they won the Super Bowl, right. As they were in the heat of this uh, showdown and trying to move to, to LA, like you can't write that. Like it's just yeah. so poetic. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's great the way the NFL plays, you know, the stories play out like that and in sports in general, that's why we get 30 for 30 because these stories come together in a way that, you know, scripted stories don't even give us. And it's, it's pretty crazy the way that that works out. I did want to mention though, um, that a lot of the, the deep fake and the, the interviews and stuff like that takes place uh, within Allegiant stadium, the new stadium of the Raiders, uh, which is in Las Vegas, obviously Al Davis and, um, uh, Pete Rozelle never got to see this stadium. You did though, didn't you? You saw at least from the outside of it, right? From the outside, yeah. Very few people have actually been inside because what? the season's <laughs> been. Uh, I don't think they've had any fans or very few fans, if that. No, it's a uh, pretty much like you can see, and that it's right across from Mandalay Bay, pretty much. Uh, there's a, it doesn't look quite as close. Like when you're driving down that street, you feel like you're sandwiched in between the two. But if you're staying at Mandalay, it's not like you're overlooking the. Um, the the place or anything actually when we were there right. earlier this year we could see them doing like a color test on the screens outside of uh, of allegiant oh cool it's a pretty cool that's very place. cool so be great um, people can go in so does it fit that that uh nickname it has of the death star <laughs> no I, I don't know i mean it's all black for one thing and i think of the death star as being more of like yeah. a silver uh, so I don't know why it has that name. Maybe from like a bubber or an angle that I'm not seeing, but yeah, I don't quite get that. I think maybe people are just sort of instilling this, the, uh, the Raiders silver and black, you know, like together to, you know, but, uh, I, I, I guess, yeah, the stadium itself doesn't really, uh, fit that, that look, but yeah, I just had to ask you about, cause it, it's a, from what we've seen from footage in, uh, obviously in this 30 for 30 and then just from watching football in general, it's a beautiful looking stadium. Yeah, it and SoFi, both great. 
Yeah, SoFi is unbelievable, which we, we saw a lot of if you watched uh, Hard Knocks this past season, which was really cool. Um, so we talked about what the overall uh, story is here. And this they start with this uh, right from the beginning, really. Uh, Al Davis, and I think to me, um, Al Davis right from the beginning is kind of hard to root for. He talks about how like money is nothing he ever had to strive for. He had it growing up. The, all he cared about was athletic glory. He came off as sort of the bad guy in every sports movie ever made <laughs> to me, at least right off the bat. Yeah. Um, he definitely has the other coach in every sports movie sort of a vibe. Exactly. Yeah. Uh, but then, but then going through all the, uh, like the legal battles and everything, I found myself, kind of on his side and, and, and seeing what, where he was coming from. I granted, um, you know, it was still, it was all, it was actually ironically ended up all being about money, uh, what he was uh, going for, why he was trying to move the team. But, um, but still, uh, as far as just, you know, fair practices go, it, it, I was on his side, I think for, for at least most of it. Yeah. I'd say I was pretty torn on it. I, I don't think I, paid to as much attention as I should have, or didn't go and find supplementary material about what the rules were. And it's like, well, yeah, a part of me says he should be able to move the team wherever he wants. But the other part of me is like, well, if they all agreed to a set of rules as part of the organization, then those should be abided by. So, so it's hard to, and then as far as like later when he talks about, you know, basically kind of the theme, the reason we're talking about such a nice stadium is that he, that was what he figured out was that to have a good product that people are going to come want to see, it's not just about the play on the field, but also just the amenities you have in these stadiums. So he was always trying to move the team and try to get a better stadium and a better deal. And, you know, in the, in the faked voiceover, he kind of talks about how getting cities to chip in for these things, and so it makes it sound at least that he's kind of like the grandfather of that whole thing. And on the whole, I think that that's bad. I don't think city <laughs> should be paying for sport team sport arenas. So right. in that case, kind of have to side against him, but it, it's definitely a lot more gray or silver, if you will. <laughs> yeah. And, and there are bits and pieces of it. Like I agree with you. Yeah. That, that city's bidding with, uh, with arenas and stuff is probably not the best uh, system, but as far as um, just him having the opportunity to move his team, that's where I kind of I kind of fell for him. But perhaps he won me over in the early going when he took a shot at the Steelers because that's always gonna that's clearly always going to to win my vote. <laughs> <laughs> there, there are a few uh, shots at the Steelers. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, the Steelers were sort of that other good team at the time when the, this uh, Al Al Davis's. Uh, the early Raiders, the John Madden uh, area era Raiders uh, were really good as well. So yeah, kind of a rivalry there. Um, you know, speaking, of the, speaking of the Steelers, there's actually a part that kind of reminds me of another thing where he has a point, but I'm not sure I agree with it where they're talking about the ice on the field and they're basically mm -hmm. the NFL is arguing, well, it's the same for both teams, but he's like, well, we have a faster, you know, offense or whatever. So it's hurting us more. And it's like, okay, yeah, but that's your style of play. We can't like calculate all of that when we're deciding right. whether or not to play this game. So whether or not they should have played or not, I think the NFL was right to say it's fair. And he's like, well, no, because we do things differently. Yeah. It kind of shows you the different perspective that they have. Whereas the NFL is like, well, we have rules. It's very clear to us and wasn't clear to him. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you on that one. Um, Speaking of, I, I mentioned uh, John Madden. I wish we had gotten to hear more from from John Madden about this whole story because I, I'm sure, you know, he has. Some, yeah, I'm sure he would have had some thoughts on how Brett Favre would have been involved in the story. And, uh, <laughs> um, but yeah, that's just another, you know, one of the biggest uh, NFL personalities of all time, and and he, you know, was involved in this story. So kind of surprised that we didn't hear from him aside from just some archived uh, footage from interviews when, when well, he was the coach. I'm pretty sure that Al Davis uh, was generated in Madden 22. So <laughs> there you go. Yeah. So there's the, there's the extra connection there. Um, some of Al Davis's story that I wasn't aware of uh, that makes him such an interesting character in the, all of this that he, he went from being a player to then a coach to a uh, commissioner and then eventually an owner. Uh, I mean, really, 
you know, had saw the game from every angle. And I mean, maybe that's why he was such a successful owner, uh, creating, you know, so many winning teams and uh, winning so many Super Bowls. Uh, I thought that was really interesting. That was something I didn't actually know about Al Davis. I mean, to be fair, I didn't know a whole bunch, whole bunch about Al Davis aside from just win baby. But uh, yeah, so that, that I thought was an interesting point. Also, the use of the NFL films music and the autumn wind is always going to get me, you know, revved up and into whatever project it is that it's involved in. So that was a, a nice touch as well. Yeah. And I, that's a great point about the, his history there is just being the commissioner of the AFL before it merged with the NFL. Like that's just so interesting that they're both commissioners and the other guy gets the head job and they already have a chip on their shoulder that, I, you know, obviously I don't know who was performing better at that point, if it was the AFL or the NFL, but keeping the NFL name, like already going to, going to have a chip on your shoulder. So it, it's just really interesting how all of that just made for storytelling. Yeah. And that, that was such an interesting time in the sport too, where you have, um, you know, before the merger, you have these two rival leagues that start poaching players from each other. And that's something you don't you don't see. I mean, I guess you see it now in like in soccer, pretty much. That's about it. Every other sport has a league that is more or less a monopoly on it. You don't you don't see the XFL taking Tom Brady next year. You know, like that's that kind of stuff just doesn't happen. So well, the WWE uh, uh, for a while there before they bought everything. But that that is that is sports entertainment. We can't legally call that uh, sport. So, <laughs> um, but yeah, you totally see your point. That that is that is one where that definitely still happens. MMA uh, recently was until, uh, I mean, I guess there's still a little bit of it there, but the UFC kind of has a stranglehold on that now. Um, so yeah, just, <laughs> they, yeah, there you go. They have, they have a guillotine choke on, on the sport right now. Um, they, they provide some context as to, uh, you know, both, both sides really like why, why a team should be able to just pick up and move and why they shouldn't. We, they, point out specifically the Minnesota Vikings uh, getting the okay to move, but they basically use that as leverage to get the city of uh, Minneapolis to give them a new stadium because the, you know, the playing outdoors in, in Minnesota, probably not great for the winter months and uh, that getting the okay to move to another city, then, you know, tra- led to the, the city giving them a new stadium, a dome stadium. Um, that collapsed. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> yeah, so I guess in the long run, that didn't work out as far as uh, keeping the weather out. But uh, the Rams then moved from from Los Angeles to Anaheim. And what's interesting there is that that was a financial move that was to to make more money for the, the franchise. And that to me was the one where, I, you know, you can't really make the argument anymore that the Raiders shouldn't be allowed to move because it's already it's already happened. Granted, it was a smaller move. But that shouldn't make a difference, really, if it's still for the same reasons. Yeah, I actually never knew that the the Rams played in Anaheim. Um, I think it's funny that Los Angeles Angels still play in Anaheim, <laughs> obviously. Um, and I thought he, or fake him, had an interesting point about Baltimore and Washington being, obviously, they both have teams and did then and then didn't and then do. Um <laughs> have teams whereas Anaheim and Los Angeles like the distance isn't that much greater on the east coast than it is for that even though they seem to people outside of California might not realize that those aren't as close as you might assume yeah that um that I mean it just so so strange I mean there's there was so much context there so much precedent being set that it, it it felt like Roselle didn't really have you know much of a leg to stand on for that argument and yet pushed on pushed for so long they kept up that that legal battle um and as we talked about a little bit earlier that there were these key points where the raiders were still winning football games throughout all of this and i think this was at the point where they had uh they had sold the season tickets for la while they still were forced to play in oakland and then they win the super bowl and i thought it was really interesting kind of a funny moment in this they Apparently, the players may or may not have had a prank on Roselle plan for the locker while in the locker room. And uh, Al Davis had apparently had the final say, allegedly had the final say. Uh, and if he had said anything other than thank you very much, commissioner, at first, uh, then that meant the prank was on. And who knows if that is actually true. But I thought that was a really interesting 
uh, you know, story to add to all of this and seeing the locker room footage there was pretty cool. Yeah, I'd say it's an interesting story. I wish that they would have elaborated and give us some sort of a hint of what that allegedly was. And I also thought it was kind of yeah. weird how it just without notice, like I, th- I felt like they maybe should have set that up a little bit and then pause, but just having the pause and then be like, oh, hey, by the way, there was this other thing going on. That was a little weird to me. But once it was over, I felt like I missed something. But then in hindsight, I was like, yeah, no, that's a fun story, but I want to know more about it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. I would, I would have, I would love to hear from some of the Raiders players of that that team to to find out more about that. Um, I found it amazing how public and how open they were about their feud. Like these, we saw so many interviews in press conferences and you know just quick scrums as they were leaving the the courthouses and stuff like that. And Al Davis just over and over again saying, you know, I don't give this guy much credit. I I don't have much respect for this guy. Uh, I thought it was, you don't see that anymore, really. I mean, there are, I guess, a few people here and there, but um, it's kind of, I thought that was kind of funny, just how how different this this rivalry was in a, a, the public eye. And then it hit a new, uh, like the peak level of petty when uh, Al Davis had a subpoena sent to Pete Rozelle during the uh, Super Bowl press conference, which I thought was really funny. And it, it, even more funny because he laughed it off and just kind of walked away from it. The other really funny moment is watching Al Davis react when they won the Super Bowl in LA. And um, Roselle was talking up the Washington football team while he's handing him the trophy. Right. You just yeah. see him kind of like roll his eyes. That was pretty funny. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it is, they really were just completely petty about every little thing. And it was, just I found it really funny how how open they were about they really just didn't like each other. Also, did you think it was weird how the way we see the Super Bowl now, whereas there's this big trophy presentation and there's a huge stage that comes out into the field at the end of the game, and in this they're just handing them the trophy in the locker room. Like it just seems so much smaller. Yeah, and it, it's funny because the this week's episode of uh, Peyton's Places also was uh, you know touched on that because they it was about Super Bowl halftime shows. And how the first Super Bowl halftime show they released like ten thousand balloons and three hundred pigeons, and that was the the halftime show. And now it's you know this crazy big thing all to itself, and people watch just for that. Uh, so yeah, it's kind of it is definitely funny how much bigger the Super Bowl is now than than what it was. I also went down a rat hole today looking at Super Bowl rings over the years and just yeah. seeing them get gaudier and uglier as you go. <laughs> Yeah, that's one of my favorite things about visiting uh, Hall of Fame. I, I've been to Cooperstown and to Canton and uh, seeing all the World Series and the Super Bowl rings just, you know, year by year. They have them all just, you know, in glass right next to each other. And it's really cool to see uh, how those have progressed. I've actually uh, held a Super Bowl ring once. So that was pretty cool. Nice. Nice. I that... taught with someone who played for the Dallas Cowboys and won Super Bowl 30. So. All right. That is, I'm, I'm definitely jealous of that, except for the fact that it's a Cowboys ring. That's less I impressive. Mean, <laughs> the only thing is that the, because it was the Cowboys, it actually was a pretty nice ring because it has a nice star on it made out of diamonds. Yeah, yeah ironically, uh, my favorite championship ring I've seen was from the Florida Marlins, and that was when they they beat the Yankees in the World Series. But uh, that that the colors of their, their team, like just, it worked really well. <laughs> um, so... The Raiders were in 1982 were eventually finally able to move to Los Angeles and had a, a great first season. But then the second season, they, of course, just win the Super Bowl because that would be how this story plays out. Um, and before the parade slash celebration in Los Angeles, they, they showed us a, um, a really a, a news broadcast and it had the best line of the entire thing, which was, uh, the last time this many people in Los Angeles got together for the Raiders, it had something to do with a lost arc. And uh, yep, that was that was just fantastic. It took me a second, but then I cracked up. <laughs> <laughs> I was yeah. like, what? Oh, oh. <laughs> yeah, so that that one, that was the best moment for me, I think. Um, then of course, because you know, it, it couldn't couldn't end with the storybook ending of them just winning a Super Bowl in LA. Uh, it progresses to them eventually not 
having things work out in LA. And uh, as we knew, we knew that they, they end up going back to Oakland, but uh, I never heard of the whole situation with Irwindale. I don't know if you were familiar with that. I mean, I know of Irwindale. I didn't know that they were looking to move there. And then I also thought it was interesting that they were looking at um, just lost the name of where SoFi is today. As soon as they mentioned that, I was like, Oh, that's funny. That's exactly. Uh, I know Al Davis. Well, deep fake Al Davis calls it Hollywood park. I don't know if that's. Yeah. Um, if there's more, some, some more specific California is not my, uh, my expertise for sure. <laughs> yeah. I forget uh, what city was in, but I that thought that was the project that Bob Iger was involved with. There was a different one that Bob Iger was looking at. Um, but that, that the slippery slope that Roselle was trying to avoid played itself out perfectly, like exactly as he expected. You have Irwindale uh, after just a few years in LA for the Raiders, you have Irwindale reaching out and sending, uh, giving Al Davis $10 million, non-refundable, uh, which of course he ended up keeping without moving to Irwindale. Uh, but then Oakland was also pushing to get them back. And then Sacramento was trying to get them. And they, they mentioned that they actually even considered Orlando. And yeah. I, I thought that was, I, that was also something I had never heard before. It would have been nice to be honest, had we had a, uh, a, um, NFL team here. I, I don't think I could have brought myself to be a Raiders fan, but you know, it would have been would have been cool to have a team here. It's really interesting that you mentioned that you couldn't bring yourself to be a Raiders fan. It's interesting how Raiders have kind of they're more than just a football team like that. That silver and black is people just like it as a logo. People are Raiders fans for no good reason. They have no connection to Los Angeles or. Uh, like when I worked in Reno Valley, there was a Raider shop there and there was some others in the area and you know, that's the Inland empire. It's not even Los Angeles and they didn't even play in Los Angeles for however many years. Um, and so it also, you know, kind of plays into a, moving to Los Angeles or sorry, moving to Las Vegas. There's already people that might've been fans just by happenstance and now are able to embrace them as their hometown team. So it, it's definitely an interesting because it's not like the Raiders have been good for a long time. Right. But they've still been, I'm sure, amongst the top list of, I mean, it'd be interesting to see where they rank in terms of merch sales. Yeah, I'm, I'm sure they're up there. They've been, you know, like you were saying, they're one of the most popular NFL franchises for a long time. I mean, when when a fan base has a nickname, there it's pretty much, uh, you know, they've got it. The, the black hole over there is, uh, you know, well, very well known. Um, I guess now in, in, in Vegas, we'll, we'll have to wait and see how that plays out in the new stadium. But, uh, so eventually we do see the team move back to Oakland, uh, in this, in this 30 for 30 here. Uh, have you random question, but I swear it, it ties in. Have you ever seen the movie basketball? Yes. I actually okay. so, threw on my DVD of it. <laughs> I immediately, as soon as I, you know, found out what the story of this 30 for 30 was, um, immediately thought of the opening to that where they are showing the map and all the franchises move. And so I had to go and get what the examples were that they gave. They said uh, the Minneapolis Lakers moved to LA where there are no lakes. Uh, the Oilers moved to Tennessee where there is no oil. The jazz moved to Salt Lake city where they don't allow music. <laughs> and the Oakland Raiders moved to Los Angeles, then back to Oakland and no one in Los Angeles seemed to notice. So, <laughs> um, that's actually how I always kind of looked at it. And aside from like the longtime franchises like the Dodgers, uh, I've always kind of pictured LA being more passive when it came to their fan bases. Um, and I always thought that they felt like that about the Raiders, to be honest. But this, uh, this documentary had, um, it showed a lot of fans like seemingly very passionate about, about the Raiders while they were there in LA, more so the ones in Oakland, but still they're, they're, seemed to be a fan base there in LA at least. Yeah. I always did think it was weird as a, as a kid that, you know, Los Angeles has two basketball teams and they have multiple. Well, I guess they had one hockey team technically, but they have other hockey teams in the area, but yeah, only no, they had no football teams, which mm. now they have two again. It, <laughs> it's, it's feast or famine there. Yeah, that's definitely true. And yeah, the, the Lakers are, are another one, I guess. Like they, it's them and the Dodgers. They own that city, I guess. Uh, I mean, the, the Clippers are really good right now, too, but we'll see if they ever get to that level. Um, 
So yeah, after after all of that, we get this big uh, emotional ending, and it, I thought again we've we've kind of we've kind of talked down the uh, the deep fake stuff and how a lot of it didn't work. But I thought that moment that where these two kind of you know actually made amends, uh, more or less in you know some way or another uh, at the end of this, I, I thought that was a, a really cool emotional moment. Um, they had already shared some of the the, the real life moments when uh, Pete Rozelle ret announced his retirement and Al Davis told the story about, you know, embracing him in the in a boardroom. And uh, so you had all of that built up and then, you know, they, they kind of, you know, more or less shake hands and ride off into the sunset in, in Allegiant Stadium and the, the deep fake versions of them. So I thought that was a really cool ending way to wrap this one up. Yeah, and then Roselle asks, by the way, did you get Two thirds vote to to move here. Yeah, yeah they and do. I want throw to look up if they did. I don't know. <laughs> yeah, they throw another funny little jab in there. So I, it was uh, it ends on a, a lighthearted note. And yeah, I, I I enjoyed this this thirty for thirty. I, it's honestly they they do such a great job with these. It's hard to find one that I really just like that I don't like. Um, do you have an idea of like where this would be on your list of thirty thirties? I mean, I'd have to watch it again. Some of my favorites are more depressing ones. <laughs> so like, <Yeah. laughs> like Fantastic Lies is one that I always bring up as being a favorite. Um, I really liked, actually the the, the uh, Ric Flair one was fun. Uh, That's actually what I would say was my favorite. I thought that was a really, really entertaining one. Yeah, uh, I'd say it's probably, it's up there. I, I, I'm not gonna commit to a number. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, the deep fake stuff does throw it off a little bit. But in terms of a story, I thought it was definitely more interesting than I anticipated just being like, oh, okay, these guys don't like each other. But there's a lot more to it. And I think um, not the longest 30 for 30, but also not the shortest. Uh, I yeah. thought that it was like well paced, uh, definitely kept my attention the entire time and told the story well. Yeah, I definitely definitely like it. I prefer my sports documentaries like this to be more about on the field stuff and the story that's playing out that that uh, you know between the players in between the lines. Um, but I think as I talked about before, with how unique their rivalry was and how public everything was and how petty it was, uh, I thought it was really entertaining and yeah, it was a, a really great story. So I think they did a really good job with this one. Yeah, and I, I definitely like seeing the footage of people being interviewed. Like, do you know where Irwindale is? <laughs> <laughs> like, I'm sure, like at the time, it was a story for like a week, and then it went away. Um, <laughs> but it's still fun to bring up, and it it just illustrates the larger point of the whole thing. Yep, I totally agree. Uh, and uh, again, it was just, it's just a lot of fun. Uh, getting into this crazy story. Any other thoughts on the, the doc as a whole before we wrap it up? Tire 30 for 30 libraries on ESPN plus. So it's uh, definitely fun to watch. And I, I can't wait till they integrate ESPN plus into Hulu. That'll make things so much better. Yeah. Just put everything in one place, make things a little bit more convenient. As I learned during my research for this, uh, this talk we just had, uh, I have not watched nearly enough, 30 for 30s. I guess I've listened to a lot more of the podcasts than I have actually watched the documentaries. But uh, yeah, I have to go on to ESPN Plus and definitely watch some more of these because they're always good, like I said. So, But anyway, so that, that does it for our Laughing Place Movie Club here tonight. Uh, next week, we'll be back with a special TV version of the Laughing Place Movie Club. I guess it's the LP TV Club. I don't know. But uh, Mike C is going to be talking about uh, some dinosaurs, which just recently got added to Disney Plus, which should be a lot of fun. So come back for that one next next Monday night. And until then, these people oh. helping us out with the schedule. Yeah. There we go. Yes. Thank you, yeah. Jan Morris. <laughs> we got barely necessities tomorrow. That's I mean, at I'm four o'clock Pacific and then Disney trivialize at 730 Pacific. Yes, and I will shamelessly plug uh, myself with Marvel Time on Wednesday if you want to watch that too. Also, Kyle and I have a Marvel podcast out, uh, Zacks of Life podcast. Uh, the fourth episode just went up today. So if you want to hear us talk about WandaVision and some other Marvel news and 
have a fun uh, Marvel themed draft. You can check that out as well. But that's it for us tonight. And uh, we'll see you again real soon. Bye. Bye.